we had a wonderful biryani in in our retreat and uh, when i thought about the word that i have the lord had placed on my heart um often sisters uh, when they cook biryani or whatever good dish um brothers can get to have the privilege of mixing it up and show off as though they have done everything after after everything of hard work goes into it and i'm doing something like that today all our dear brothers have labored in uh, covering huge grounds of the scripture uh, yes if you have read through some of the chapters there are around 60 plus verses and uh, god had enabled us to study the book of nimaya and learn some wondrous things um and i'm here to again refresh us and primarily bring to us i don't know once you find a dessert after the cake is prepared somebody comes and puts a cherry on top of it right to say this is done uh, that is my task today so don't envy me <laughs> but just uh, let's look to the lord as uh, a big uh, a brief recap of what we saw right from the beginning not to go into every detail but at a very high pic- high level big picture of what we see from the book of nehemiah we're going to touch on two simple questions um that are very important for us sometimes we can go into such nitty gritty detail and lose the big picture sometimes we can go into learning all the precious lessons and miss to be in awe of a god who has worked out and who is behind the working that he does in and through the precious things that we learned and so my desire today as we uh last week we saw uh, brother pratap covering chapter 13 uh bringing to us a uh, learning but my desire is that we would once take a step back and look at the book of nimaya in a manner that our lives can be challenged we can learn precious lessons we can understand them and we can say great these are wonderful lessons but our our learning is primarily as a man of god says for living our learning is for living it out and so we need to be challenged by the word of god to be living out his word and for that we ought to be taking this step back and so as we come we began to look at this book often this book is sadly preached or seen when a church needs a building project <laughs> or when there is a budget crisis that the church would want everybody to step in pitch in and do their part see the people of nimaya did just that everybody did their part and so sadly that is how this book had been boxed into or characterized which is not what we should be taking this for yes it is true the people of god in the time of nehemiah did their parts we do have parts but it is not just a building project in fact there is a greater thing of what god is at work which we ought to recognize so that we are revived in this rebuilding and redeeming work that god is doing and so that is an introductory comment i'll have us just briefly review as we come back to the so we began this particular book with this call arise and let us build arise and let us build and when we did that this is from nehemiah chapter 2 verse 17 uh we saw that the walls that were built in the time of nehemiah had a greater significance just than just music, mere physical walls they are no simple structures as we look at them as we see through the scriptures that 
the walls represent the sovereignty of God, meaning God is sovereignly at work, meaning he's on the throne and he is in charge. Even though in this world that we live in, there is a God of this world who is at work actively, for his time is short, but above him, beyond him, there is this God who is on the throne. We read that in Revelation chapter 19 as we come to verses 5 and 6. Our Lord God omnipotent reigneth. This is the uh, complete unveiling of what the situation is in the universe that God had made. Yes, for a time it doesn't seem so when situations go out of control, but we come to recognize through the lens of the scripture that our God is a sovereign God and he's still on the throne. And so often when a city had walls around it, there was a king enthroned in on the throne. When the city didn't have a king, the city or the kingdom never even had any protection of walls. So that actually shows to us, as the scripture itself shows uh, in Judges, the last chapter, the last verses we see, and there was no king and everybody did according to what they wished. You know, when the God, when, when God is not on the throne of our hearts and of our lives and of our churches and of our, uh, of, uh, of all that we see in this world, you and I can get to doing whatever we would want. And so we saw that there is the significance of sovereignty, there is the significance of separation. You know, the key that Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah teaches to us is that there is a lack of distinction and separation between God's people and the people that were living around with mixed generations. And for that separation to happen, the walls were required to be built after which there was this distinction and separation that was brought back. And so we learned that walls have this significance of separation. And also we saw walls have significance of salvation. We saw that in Isaiah, I won't go back in detail. So after looking at that, we also saw that today, if there is one thing that the church is in the need of our, it is this desperate, challenge, uh, it is this desperate condition called the condition of reproach that we saw. We saw this word called compromise. If there is one word that the church in these last days can be easily related to, it is this word called compromise. The church and the world have no distinction. The church is in the world and the world is in the church and so everything there is no clear demarcation. And we saw that when God has seen his people in the time of Nehemiah, that their, the name of God upon them was having reproach. God was at this task of rebuilding. And uh, you and I might come to the book of Nehemiah and, and think, and yes, in some ways it is true that Nehemiah was a man of God who was having such a burden for the people of God and for the reproach onto the name of God that he didn't keep silent, but he wanted, even if it means for God to take him and use him, he was wanting for God's name to be brought back to renown or rather than reproach, he wanted it to be honored and renowned. And uh, that is why he, we see that from the challenge of reproach, from the state of reproach, we saw that towards the end, there is the state of renewal that God's people come to. We saw that last, last week. People of God have not only seen that there is this rebuilding of the walls that have happened, but people of God have come to see that there is a renewal Renewal in many areas. Renewal towards scriptural living. We see that in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 1. Whenever they see something in the word of God, do you see 
the attitude of the people of God in Nehemiah chapter 13 verse 1 and on that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of people and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. And then in verse 2 we see the description, the reasoning and in verse 3, now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. There is this rededication towards scriptural living. That's the state of renewal that they have come to. There is no more like, oh, this, is this what the word of God says? Maybe I'll try to think and obey a few days later. That's not the attitude of the people of God. Their attitude was implicit obedience. A state of renewal where they were committed to scriptural living. They were also committed to Sabbathic rededication. We saw that in chapter 13, in verses uh, 19 we read, And it came to pass, when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut, and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates, and they, there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. We see that the Lord of Sabbath is again being honored, because the people were made for, the people were not made for Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for the people of God. We see that in Mark chapter 2, towards the end of that portion, that God, through this word clarifies, when Jesus was upon this earth, the rabbis and the Pharisees and Sadducees were seeing that Jesus, in their view, was breaking the Sabbath. And he says, I am the Lord of Sabbath. And in fact, Sabbath has been made for you, not people for the Sabbath. Don't push, burden the people with more regulations than what it is actually meant to be. It is meant to be a rest for you, for the people of God. And so, here is the people during the time of Nehemiah, they were being restored to be committing, to be rededicated to Sabbath. And so we saw that. Now, the third thing is, there is this separation from mixing. We saw that in Nehemiah chapter 13, the first verse as well, and also uh, first three verses, and also even in the last set of verses, from verses 23. Let's read verses 23. And uh, here we come to read, In those days also I saw Jews that had married wives of Astoth, of Amnon, and of Moab. And their children spake half in the speech of, the Ast of Astoth, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And we all saw how Nehemiah stands up against them in verse 27. Shall we then hearken unto you, to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives. And then he chased out Joiada, the son of Elisha, the high priest, who marries, who was the son-in-law of Senbalat, the Hornite. And so here we see how there is this separation from the mixing that uh, the people of God during the time of Nehemiah were brought back to. When we look at all this, it could not be but people of God having been brought to a state of renewal. And that happened because of these two things. It is not just because of a rebuilding of the walls. If that was the case, there should have been just a physical walls and Nehemiah would have gone back and have not bothered to do anything. But we see that apart from rebuilding, there is this further uh, work of God in reviving the people of God, to bring them to renewal. And so we saw through all this, as we saw in the first six chapters, seven chapters rebuilding, was chapter one and two, we saw the anguish and the availability of Nehemiah. You know, when we look at our state of affairs of the people of God, that is the church of God in these last days, you and I should be challenged do we have the same anguish? Do we have the same availability 
for God to take away the reproach in his name, on his name, to bring his people to a state of renewal. That's a challenge you and I ought to be taking. Now second, we saw that there is this assistance of people. People were willing to step up. When Nehemiah calls them to rebuild the wall, they were willing to step up. And there was an anger of the enemy. True work of God always has opposition. It doesn't go without opposition, without the work of the enemy. And we saw that there is this attack of the enemy, apart from the anger of the enemy. We also saw that God's people were brought to assembly to have usury or interest extraction being taken away in chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, we saw the accomplishment. Primarily, when we look at the accomplishment, take note in chapter 6, verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. The accomplishment was so supernatural that even the enemies had to give in and say, it had to be God that this wall was built in such short time. And uh, when we think about that, we'll come to see in the next chapters, there was this awareness of future as Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem, uh, from Jerusalem to the palace. He looks forward and he keeps a faithful man in charge in chapter 7. Now, beyond that, we see in, in chapter 8 onwards, the step of revival that begins. There is no more with regards to the rebuilding of the wall, particularly, but there is a revival that kick, that uh, gets to come out and it begins in chapter 8, the awakening through God's word. They let God's word have its due place. Where is the place of God's word? The highest, the supreme place. When God's word is restored to its due place, there is awakening, there is revival. We saw that in the recipe for revival and rejoicing. You and I, if we would long for revival, we ought to see that every one of us let the due place for God's word to be given. And that actually results in not just revival, but rejoicing. We see this wonderful statement from the book of Nehemiah. Many a times, if, even if we don't remember the whole book in chapter 8, verse 10, the phrase that, that really catches us in awe is, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Indeed, God desires not just for a revival, but rejoicing in Him. And that should become our strength for our day-to-day -day living. That we rejoice in the Lord so much that we cannot but live for Him. And that is the portion of God's people as a revival breaks out. In chapter 9, we come to see uh, that there is this appealing through prayer. We saw that uh, Nehemiah prays a long prayer. For some of us who pray long, <laughs> this is a, a good encouragement, uh, especially in the church. <laughs> but I don't know if Nehemiah prayed that long in the church or in the people of God. Maybe yes, but uh, but one thing is, we can pray long, especially in our closet prayer time. Uh, you need to look at the small kids sometimes. I have two small kids. When, when the family prayer goes a little longer, <laughs> soon enough the question will come back. Why do you pray so long? <laughs> so often long prayers uh, are for our closet prayers. But nonetheless, there is this relaying of history that Nehemiah does. Prayers sometimes need reflection of what God did so that we are not caught up in just trying to let God deal with our problems, but let God deal with us first so that we are enabled to handle the problems. And so there is this confession and affirmation of the covenant. Chapter 9, the last verses we see that they set in writing the covenant they could just say, I verbally agree the covenant of God. The priests and the Levites, they say, we will put it in writing. You know that when I read that, it seemed marvelous. If, if there is a stone, they would say, let's etch it in that stone. 
so that I would not, I would not again change my mind. That's how they were committed. And we saw in that chapter 9 the humility from moving to eye-centeredness to the to the God-centered life that God has called us. And that happens through prayer. There's so much of, of, God's, uh, of lives moving away from self-centeredness to God-centeredness happening in prayer. We also saw in chapter 9 that there is this attending to and around the house of God. You know, revival is never just personal. It actually begins from the house of God in so much that there is a, a complete dedication to the house of God. We saw that phrase in chapter 10, the last verse. It, it is so resounding. It says, we will not forsake the house of our God. That was a statement of a kind. We saw in Teach Us Your Ways, as people of God were willing to learn from the ways of God, from the Word of God, they learned to be dedicated to God. They learned to be not forsaking the house of God. And so we are called, we are challenged to be so committed in our lives. Chapter 11, we also saw, uh, moving forward, chapter 11 and 12, we see some wonderful things. There was this populating of Jerusalem. Yes, Jerusalem walls are built. Jerusalem city is now secure. But if nobody wants to stay there, what is the use? So was God bringing in those that would take that risk of moving in forward to be in Jerusalem. Apart from those that volunteered, there were those of potters or singers, worship leaders in choir who stayed to continue the worship of God. And so all this we saw that it was primarily for the new Jerusalem as a, as a sermon that we saw that God was in the task of building new Jerusalem. We see that you and I can be just lost that, oh, Nehemiah's time that happened, it may not be anything related to our lives. But just like old Jerusalem, there is this new Jerusalem that God is at work actively building his church. And here in those two chapters, we saw precious lessons that the people that live there, they speak to us in what God is at work in building his bride, that is the new Jerusalem. Quickly, in chapter 13, we saw that there is this arousing of godly zeal. Uh, there's one phrase that I, I was wanting to kind of memorize. Uh, this was a statement that a man of God made. He said, real man of God doesn't touch even the tip of God's glory. We can so easily be seeking for glory, but we read in the scripture so wonderfully, the scripture says that in his presence, no flesh shall glory. And uh, that's a learning that we as people of God should constantly put uh, back to ourselves, including me. So in, verse, in chapter 13, we saw last week that there is this godly zeal for a godly living that was kindled by people looking to the scripture and living out the scripture. Now, as we come today, um, I said we would look at the overall picture of Book of Nehemiah and uh, I've titled my today's sermon as Remember Me, O My God. In chapter 13, the last phrase that Nehemiah puts in his book as it becomes God's word is, we can see that it is Nehemiah who put, right? He, he says it, remember me, O my God. Remember me, O my God. We're going to consider that, but there's this question that we should ask when we look at this book of Nehemiah. Having studied the whole book of Nehemiah, the question that should come obviously to us, yes, there are precious lessons that we learned, um, but why is the book of Nehemiah in God's word? That might seem like a very um, base kind of a question. 
um, we've learned so much, right? So that's why God put this book in the Bible. Yes, um, lessons that are learned can be categorized into a number of areas. Let me give us a list of those. One, there are spiritual lessons learned. There are moral lessons learned. There are general lessons learned. And uh, there are analogical lessons or in contrast what we learn from those people that lived and we who are living in the last days. So these are the common ways in how you and I come to God's word, especially the Old Testament. Um, in trying to glean for ourselves what God has to teach for us. But it is vitally important. I mean, this is a learning for me as well. When I was studying uh, on a material of what I need to be careful when I'm preaching or teaching and learning from the Old Testament, a man of God by name Sidney um, Gridenius. He is a, a, a professor in Calvin um, theological seminary, he happened to put together a material very important uh, for us as students of God's Word uh, to learn that it is so easy for us to shortcut what God would want us to learn by coming to just taking moral principles or lessons from God's Word. You and I can easily spiritualize, moralize, allegorize, and also generalize the Old Testament scriptures, it seems. If only our learnings are from that, there is this great danger. The danger is that it wouldn't actually result in transformation to living out God's word, it seems. When you and I come to learn God's word in just spiritualizing, allegorizing, moralizing, generalizing, it would be great lessons that you and I have learned, but nothing would come out of it, it seems. God would want us to come to the Old Testament through the cross and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that puts us a great challenge as to how we come to it. How are we to come to the book of Nehemiah and see what God would want us to see so that he can work in us all the lessons that we learn from the book of Nehemiah. Unless we come to it from the work and the person of Jesus Christ, our learnings would be just learnings and for, for our knowledge not for our living. And so that as a challenge, when we come to the book of Nehemiah, you and I would then ask this question, why is it that God had put the book of Nehemiah in God's word? Some of the reasons before I go to why we should not just come to the book of Nehemiah, um, we see that there is an interesting thing if you have observed through this book of Nehemiah, there is no direct reference to the book of Nehemiah from the New Testament. Have you come across any scripture portion in the New Testament that points directly to the book of Nehemiah? And that, pro that actually gives us an even more difficult challenge. Usually, the Old Testament is a concealing or the New Testament sheds light on the Old Testament truths. That is, if you and I are not able to understand the New Te Old Testament scripture portions, when we come to the New Testament, there is a mention of them, some of, most of them, to help us get to the Old Testament in a right way. But when we come to the book of Nehemiah, there isn't any direct reference that we would come across. Uh, we wouldn't even see a messianic prophecy coming out of the book of Nehemiah. Do you see a messianic prophecy? We've been, we've been through the book of Isaiah, right? Through the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6, what do you remember? For unto us a son is born, or 
a son is given. Sorry, the child is born and the son is given. And we come to see the messianic prof prophecy through the book of Isaiah, a number of them. But when we come to the book of Isaiah, uh, Nehemiah, we don't see a Christocentric prophecy in that there isn't a prophetic utterance towards what Christ would come and accomplish, which is why it is so difficult to just uh, not see from what Christ did on the cross. Let, let's move on to the, another important thing. We don't even see a theophany. By the way, many of us may not know what a theophany is. Theophany is an appearance of God. See, when we look at the Old Testament in Genesis or in Exodus, God appears, or Joshua, God appears uh, to certain people and he relays certain truths or certain prophecies or uh, in a way that he communicates something. We don't see that directly in this book of Nehemiah, that God had actually appeared. It even doesn't seem like God came to Nehemiah and said, okay, now you are commissioned to go to Jerusalem and build the walls. Not even that. And that puts us in a great challenging position as to how are we to come to the book of Nehemiah? And why is the book of Nehemiah in God's word? Now, when we come to this, we come to see that there is this, it's a, it's a plain historical narrative. Meaning that there is a history of what happened during the time of Nehemiah. That God in his great wisdom had put it in the word of God. Now, when we come to the book of Nehemiah, we cannot miss to see this work of God. By the way, you and I can easily give in to say, oh, what a leader is Nehemiah. He built the walls. He revived the people. But that should not be our deduction from this book. You and I can be in great danger if you and I would say it was Nehemiah who rebuilt the walls or revived the people. It was God who is at work to rebuild the walls and revive God's people. And that's a mile away from what we can take from the book of Nehemiah. The reason being, God could use anybody for that matter. And it happened to be that Nehemiah was willing to align himself to the plan of God. Do you think if Nehemiah was not willing to go leave his palatial luxury and go to the land of this, uh, this, uh, this rubble that was there to build the walls, the walls would not be built? I'm 100% I'm sure the walls would have been built. But it would have been another man of God. It would have been another one. So is it with God's work. So is God in the redemptive history he is at work, and he, it's the privilege of Nehemiah to let his heart be burdened with the heartache of God. As we see from chapter 1, when Nehemiah hears the news, there were many others who might have heard the same news. The walls of Jerusalem are in rubbles. But Nehemiah didn't let his heart to be growing cold, growing cold to the love of God to all that he knows about the God of Israel, to leave them in rubbles. He was willing to align himself. And so was Nehemiah privileged to be taken up by God, to be led by God, and to be used by God in the rebuilding and reviving. Oh, we can easily mistake that it is Nehemiah and lose the whole picture that God is at work of rebuilding and reviving his people. Now, the second thing that we see is God's working his redemptive plan. You know, through and through, the Bible is a book of God's redemptive story. God is working out his redemptive plan, even till date. In the church that God is building, it is God at work in his redemptive plan. Not an individual, not 
a few people, but it is God at work. And so, though this book of Nehemiah is a historical narrative, you and I are to come to it and see God at work in his redemptive plan. Now, one question that we can ask is, what is the redeeming work that God did here? Um, and as we come to see that there are, uh, there are the aspects of redemption that God is doing. When we um, come to, okay, let me go there. When we come to uh, the, the book of Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 22 to 28, sorry, 23 to 28, there is one important thing that you should notice, that there were these mixed marriages that were happening among the people of God. You know, it was vital that God would bring forth a correction among God's people, so much so that this trend of mixed marriage that began affluently in the priesthood. We see in 29, remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of priesthood and of the Levites. And what did they do? They married strange wives, right? You know, it begins with the leadership or it begins with the Levites in allowing mixed marriage to be okay. And you know, sooner or later, it would have been spreading like a wild fire or a cancer to the rest of the Israelites. And if God would not have used Nehemiah, I mean, not that Nehemiah is great here, but God had used Nehemiah to put a stop to this mixed marriages that were happening, there was this certain trend that would have proceeded forward to the rest of the people of Israel, so much so that the, that the Davidic line that ought to come out to bring forth the Savior. We come to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. When we come to the book of, the, the Gospel of Matthew, Gospel, Matthew is taking a lot of time in and through the whole chapter one of the gospel to bring to us one important truth. If there is one thing that he is trying to bring is that he is, this is centered, the gospel of Matthew can be seen from one verse in a simplest way in verses 17. Verses 17, we read, And all the generations of Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Three 14, so simple as a math equation. But it is vital that if there is any time where their mixed marriages could continue to spread to corrupt the Davidic line, it would have been in these last 14 generations. Not so much so in the other two times. Abraham to David, David to Babylon would have been much easy. But the last 14 generations have come to a place where the leadership have, or the Levites, the priests, who were to be very holy, preserving, not to intermarry, have got in to have their generation to be corrupted, mixed. It would have been so easy for the Judaic line, the Davidic line, to be mixed up. To have that prophecy that is so vital that Messiah should come from the Davidic line. God was at, re at work in the redemptive plan. Christ had to come from the Davidic line, not just one way. We see, interestingly, as Matthew presents the genealogy of Christ, and as Luke presents the genealogy of Christ, we see from both the parents, Jesus' genealogy account goes back straight to David. Both the parents. So wonderfully, God preserves this genealogical line. You know why? The reason being that he is after this redemptive work. He is after this redeemer 
whom he has promised in Genesis chapter 3 that he would be the seed of the woman, whom he has promised in Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 verse 3, in and through your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 17 we see that he speaks to David that thy throne would be established forever and ever. Messiah had to come from Davidic line. And God is at this work of preserving the Davidic line to bring forth the Redeemer through which he will bring forth his redemptive plan whereby he is going to build his church. After he was born, after he lives out 30 years fulfilling the law, completely, perfectly, he stands tall in Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 and 17, he says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, today, who is it building his church? Christ is the one who is at work, building his church. It might seem like few people are working hard, but it is the privilege of them to work for the Lord. Not a clue of what God is at work in his redeeming, rebuilding, reviving work that God is at work. And so here we come to see that God is working his redemptive plan. And the book of Nehemiah contributes to the redemptive plan of God in working his way through the history of mankind. Quickly, the third reason as why the book of Nehemiah stands there, God's preparing for his, his Redeemer to come, meaning the people of God were needing to be revived from the things of the ways of the world in, cha in, in the point two, but in, in point three is what I have been talking about. That is the Redeemer had to come from the Davidic line, which is why God had worked through Nehemiah and the people of Nehemiah that lived, and he preserves it in the word of God that we come to. Now, quickly, we'll come to the second question, and then we'll close. It should not be too long. Bear with me. And so when we come to the book of Nehemiah, and any book in the Old Testament, we ought to come to it in the redemptive plan of God. Yes, they're all historical narratives. You and I can easily get into spiritualizing, allegorizing, generalizing, moralizing. That is, you can take few moral principles and think that it'll change you. It won't. If that be the case, God would have made Bible to be moral science book. How many of us had moral science book <laughs> in our schooling? <laughs> moral science book didn't change us, by the way. <laughs> if that changed us, we didn't need Jesus to save us, right? Moral science book lived like a good moral science book. We were taught nice moral principles. We forgot those moral principles. It wouldn't retain. It wouldn't remain. It wouldn't redeem. God's word is not moral science book. It is a transforming book because of what the Redeemer does in and through his redeeming words that he gives to us. And we need to see that redeeming plan of God through the redemptive history of mankind. That is what we come to see in the Bible. How God is at work in his redemptive plan. Now quickly, now apart from coming to God's word, especially the historical narratives, in the bigger picture of the redemptive plan, that's one important thing when we come to the Old Testament books like the book that we see, and even the book of Esther. Interestingly, unlike the book of Nehemiah, where we see a mention of God, there's one characteristic of the book of Esther. You won't even see the mention of God there. You can easily be lost in moralizing to the highest extent, missing to see the redeeming God who is working background. And so here we learn an important thing when we come to the Old Testament books, that we are to come to it in the grander redemptive plan of God, which is what we've seen in why God had put the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Now quickly, what is the 
authorial intent of the book of Nehemiah, meaning what is it that when Nehemiah is going to stand beside me and he's going to look to all of us and see what we have, are taking from the book of Nehemiah, would he like catch his head and then crush himself underneath or would he just be happy? <laughs> Think about that for a moment. What would be the response of Nehemiah after we studying through the book of Nehemiah and concluding to the book of Nehemiah? That's what is the authorial intent. By the way, authorial intent means it's not just the physical human author, but then there is a greater purpose. It is the Spirit of God who had authored the Word of God. Leave about Nehemiah. What is God, the Spirit of God, who had authored His Word, wanting for us to take, take away from this book? That is vitally important. Yes, we learned so many wonderful examples, godly examples, which is good. But what is His intent? Is it just being inspired by people who lived during the time of Nehemiah? Or is it to be transformed by that Spirit of God who had authored the book of Nehemiah? That's an important question to ask and answer for our lives. Or how did they look at themselves? The people of God who were living out in the time of Nehemiah, how were they looking at themselves? Were they looking to themselves as, look, we were the ones who built the walls? Or were they looking to themselves in a different way? How was Nehemiah looking to himself? Oh, I am the leader who had this able administrative skills? Or I am the one who is a man of prayer? Or I am the one who brought revival among God's people? Did all those people see to themselves as how we are seeing them? That's an important question. And then thirdly, how are we to receive God's word through the book of Nehemiah? That is a question. These are some questions that would clear out some misunderstandings that you and I might take, unfortunately. So as we come to it, we'll answer with very simple one or two points and then we'll close. We're going to be done in two minutes, few minutes, just bear with me. So it's, when we come to the book of Nehemiah, we've seen that we've, we, have, we have come to it from the redemptive plan of God in what God is at work. And it was the privilege of Nehemiah to be used of God. Yes, we are not building any walls today. We are not building any church buildings. So you and I might easily say this is not applicable for me at this time. But as God was working in that time of history, in his redemptive plan, God is working in this time of history in the same redemptive plan. What is that redemptive plan? He is at work in building his church. We saw that. He is at work in building his church. And if that be the case, how is the Spirit of God impressing upon us to come, to come alongside of God in letting God work his kingdom in us and use us to work in his kingdom? So here we come to see the first one is God's building his kingdom. In the Old Testament, it was the kingdom of Israel, so much so to bring forth from this nation salvation, right? God built a nation to bring forth salvation, that is a savior. And in this New Testament, God is building his church. And that is the kingdom of God. When Jesus came into this world, he said, behold or repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and then he ushered in the kingdom of God. And so as we see that God is building his kingdom in his redemptive plan, we come to take note that, second part, is that you and I need to let that kingdom work first happen in us. You cannot, you cannot be part of God's kingdom work 
to be used of God until he has worked in you and me. Turn with me to this one verse in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. That Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that he that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burdened, sorry, burned with fire. In verse 4, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You know, here we come to see an important thing, that before God could use Nehemiah, God had to work in him that work that he was about to use Nehemiah for. And that is, in the presence of God, he allowed God to work in him. He allowed God to work in him, so much so that he could be used of God to work for him. And that's an important lesson to be learned. And that's why, when we come to read all that Nehemiah does through the whole book of Nehemiah, often again and again, this God who began initially didn't leave him. In fact, Nehemiah didn't leave, didn't leave this God as well. Time and again, when situations arised, when troubles were there, when opposition was strong, when challenges were there, he was hanging on, leaning on, depending on, turning to this God again and again and again. Primarily to show to us that he was what he was by the grace of God. We come to see Apostle Paul saying the same statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's turn there. And I'm sure Nehemiah would have said the same thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 11, we come to read in the words of Apostle Paul, where he says, Now therefore, sorry, let's read verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. You know, the grace of God that saves us is the grace of God that is going to stay with us, to use us to work for Him. And He cannot work for He cannot use us to work for Him until He works in us before He can use us. And we see that Paul could labor so much right? But I labored more abundantly. But quickly he goes to attribute that yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I'm very sure Nehemiah would have been saying the same thing. And that was affirmed to us in all the way that he depends on this God whose grace was sufficient. Paul learns that in a wonderful way in Second Corinthians chapter 12. He learns it when Paul prays for his own self, the answer from God was, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. So was Nehemiah, that his grace, God's grace was sufficient so that he could be used. It was his immense privilege. Now quickly in closing, the last one that I have is that there are these nine prayers mentioned by Nehemiah. And uh, of all that, we see one phrase that echoes out. One phrase that echoes out. And that phrase is, remember me, O God. That speaks volumes. Nehemiah had not even thought that he was somebody to be used by God. He came to recognize that he was like anybody 
God just needed a person. It was, it happened to be me. And that's why he didn't even credit anything to himself to say, look, I am that able administrator or a man of prayer or a, a wise builder or anything for that matter. But he turns to God and says, remember me, O God. You know, our God in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, sorry, 6, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, we come to read that our God is not a God who forgets the labor of love. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Today, if there is one thing you and I need to be very clear is whether you and I are part of it or not, God is at his work in, re in building his church. God is at his work in reviving his people. It's our immense privilege if you and I get to be part of it. In the smallest way, to whatever way, that you and I can come to align with God, to lean on God, be used of God, and turn to God and fi finally and say, Oh, the grace of God that used me. And we would say, Remember me. Remember me, my God. And what a privilege that would be at the end of our lives where we would say, Remember me, O oh God. And uh, may that be our portion as we have learned from the book of Nehemiah and the life of Nehemiah that we don't so run after Nehemiah but we run after the God of Nehemiah, who is the God of our lives as well.